and thank you for inviting us to speak about community and what we do with the dojo, agile method, learning. There's a lot of interesting words on here. Um, we will uh, be centering all of our, our um, content, of course, around one of our key principles, people are not a problem, rather an innovation source. And yeah, so we'll get started on Insightful Learning, Inner Source Dojo Way. Here, just to make sure we have attribution, myself, Bill, uh, be presenting, featuring, but then also, you know, Jim Manzullo, Anu, and Ryan. And here's an outline of some of the, the things we're going to go through. You can take a quick look before transitioning, and we will hand off to Jimmy uh, once Ryan transitions the slide. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. Um, so hello, everybody. I'm here to talk a little bit about um, a team that we know as Everest. Uh, Everest is the name given to a team that transformed from a traditional um, uh, operations team to a DevOps generative team. It's a narrative that will be referenced from time to time in, in this presentation. And really, what I'm here to talk about is also the condition or the catalyst for change that was uh, uh, needed, right? Our, it was a natural evolution of our product and how we delivered those products that really was the catalyst for us to get going into a DevOps generative team framework. Um, and we really needed to zero in on three areas of focus, that being people, process, and products. Along the way, um, we certainly had our impediments. Um, a few of them early on was really centered around two words, that being trust and transition, right? We needed to trust the transition into a, a DevOps team um, from a traditional operations team, first and foremost. We needed to trust uh, feeling comfortable with transitioning into new roles. Um, we needed to trust transitioning into new technology stacks that, that were required to deliver our product. And then ultimately, um, you know, we, we, we needed to trust um, in our technical ability to work within those those uh, technology stack frameworks. Uh, we eventually made it to the summit uh, and then quickly realized that getting to the summit was just the beginning of our journey. And before you transition, Ryan, if you could go back for a second, I just want to touch on, you know, the first summit, you know, was, was really, you know, our first our first shift getting up, you know, getting up up the mountain the first time. Um, you know, later we started unlocking uh, new revenue, uh, realized revenue, which is important for the business. So it really was driving towards a strategy. Uh, the, the last time we checked, four, four million plus in uh, new revenue by by being able to uh, you know run run these workloads in areas that were that were uh, free from some of our data constraints. So it really it really became a, a thing to continue to invest further in. The more times we went up and down the mountain. Go ahead, Ryan. And then, you know, how do we, how did we really do this? Because this was really for a traditional IT team to, to step into, you know, a department of thirty to fifty people, step into these, uh, into these unknowns. So you know, there's a lot of inspirations along the way. You know, relax completely. You know, to engage, engage those unknowns as opportunities. So it was a, it was a big shift. You know, I want to call out, you know, each one of these, uh, these institutions or organizations or people. Uh, had a very impactful uh, impression on us, uh, and I will especially call out uh, Sam Fell. It was was one of the ones who uh, who during his tenure at Sumo Logic helped get our helped us understand our story and get our story out of you know kind of just uh, inside our local silos. And then a few other people like Jeremy McMillan, Alfred Darby, Chris Chris Eady, and then of course you know some other networks like Dojo Consortium and people like, you know, Fred and the Thingy Farm and, you know, some of these other other uh, organizations like Zen Leader and uh, Black Swan Group have really, really helped us quite a lot. So I just wanted to center on that before moving forward. And, you know, so one of the first things in that journey Jimmy was talking about was, you know, how are we going to go from this traditional IT? How are we going to do this shift? You know, one thing is where we did have code, uh, it was, you know, very siloed, right? And so as part of our upskill, we didn't have the requisite knowledge and expertise. And we decided to challenge uh, the the sort of the status quo and, and live the SAP value of, of uh, you know, build bridges, not silos. And we committed to a principle of openness. So we realized that by making our learning journey 
a, one, a dojo, but two, open an open dojo within the construct of, you know, the scope of SAP. And by doing that, we really get that, what I call that inner source scaling effect. So, you know, where our original aim was 30 to 50 individuals, and essentially that would be about, you know, 60 to 100, what we call belt claims, very localized due department without an increase in resources, we then, you know, it's 10 X that it, at least, and we weren't really collecting stats at the beginning, to be honest. So we, we get like, you know, potentially, you know, far more diverse perspectives coming through the dojo, it's mutual influence, you know, in, in creating a much more inclusive, high quality model for, uh, for what we were doing to, to learn a new domain, for example, and very tactically Kubernetes, but also agile, and and also embracing change through mindset, and we'll talk about those later. But the 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 inner source scaling effect is is really quite powerful, and not just you know what we've noticed in the dojo, but this is just one one example of that. Yeah, there was no resources at all, but there was definitely heavy. Ryan, your mic's a little off. Great. Oh yeah, um, yeah, and so through all those different intersections. You know, we're learning as we go. We're learning these different groups coming through. We're starting to see some similar patterns. So what we what we've settled on is this really became an emergence of an agile method, right? So we, how we qualify it as inner source dojo ways. You know, there's there's fundamentals here. One, what we observe is there's flow blockage in technology organizations. So we start to see thrashing, you know, scapegoating, disengagement. You know, the types of things on the surface you don't really like to see. Um, another fundamental is there there are deep rooted factors influencing this flow blockage. And so if you remember the the first principle of people are not a problem, rather an innovation source, we have to kind of resist that reflex to you know blame other departments and and kind of come together. So but that's that's great, but how do we do that? And we start to be able to find what is really impeding us from coming together. and we 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 define that as entangled mindsets. And this is, you know, there's links, you know, throughout this deck. And if you would follow that one later, looking at the deck, it would go to growth mindset under positive psychology, for example. So that's a heavy influence. Um, third fundamental is what are we going to do about this, right? So there are there are methods which can be applied to liberate flow, right? So things you can start to see, your technical output, your quality improving. And we start to see uh, in, the, in the social system, we start to see alignment, people striving together so that scapegoating has moved into striving and that disengagement starts to move into remotivation. And then we, we describe, you know, our, our method overall, our superset method as insightful learning. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Hi everyone. So the, this is a quick slide on uh, the concept of what the dojo is not. So, uh, there is a tendency, like Michael's describing, especially when there's change in a in the industry or an organization, uh, to make changes that are drastic based out of fear. But the dojo is transformational versus a destructive change. And so we'll revisit this later on about how our organization kind of realized that and changed in a, a positive transformational way versus a destructive way. Michael? Right. And so we said not dojo. So then what is dojo? What helps us, uh, you know, what can we do in the affirmative alternative of that destructive response, right? So a, a very important response for humans is to, you know, when they have un unknown change, just, you know, that could be dangerous, right? So there's there's a difference, though, between danger and, and uncomfortable, psychologically, you know, un uncomfortable change. So but we need an affirmative alternative to be able to kind of work through that um, that that change energy pulse that comes through. So with the dojo is systems thinking languages. So there's various. Here's some examples of the types of certain things you'll see, you know, throughout throughout our dojo curriculum. They come through our circles, and we'll talk about that shortly. Uh, you know, one of my favorite is the the change curve there on the left, and then of course, very deep favorite of mine with my DevOps background is the, you know, the Dora framework. So, you know, I think this is a strong framing. Uh, the diffusion of ideas is quite popular. And of course, Wardley is very important. Uh, I think that the metaphors are quite strong with Wardley and it's probably maybe the most neutral, uh, neutrally connotative um, thing that people can kind of uh, connect with. 
And then you can look at, you know, things like the, the Cartman drama triangle, which can help for, for groups that uh, do deep agile, uh, that, that comes out of a, a mental model dojo, an agile dojo uh, somewhere else in the industry uh, that, that has influenced us. But it's important that these languages are not con conflated with the idea of truth, right? So we get a new language, we start to be confident with it, and it can it can be like, that's the truth. And, and so I have a quote here, and this one uh, was introduced to our group uh, by one of our inspirational members, Jeremy McMillan. Um, this is a George Box quote. Uh, you can look it up. It's kind of fun. All models are wrong, but sometimes useful. And that's something to help keep us balanced and um, keep more, keep these languages as, as you know, available to us, but without, without overly constraining us. So the, one of the components of a dojo is the concept of the circle. So the circle is a uh, gathering together of peers to discuss a, a domain of knowledge within the dojo. So whether it's mindset or inner source or agile. And uh, the way uh, a circle starts is simply the coming together of people who are interested in that given domain. So people will gather on a call, they'll talk about the items of interest. Uh, we have some learning materials in the dojo that are usually the topics that we cover, especially at the beginning. And then what we see is that uh, the evolution of the circle and folks uh, leveling up while that happens. One of the key components of the circle is that folks are uh, feel safe and that they can share uh, their thoughts on uh, the topic at hand safely. And so for the, the safe part of this, I'm gonna hand off to Anu. Anu, if you wanna talk about the safety component yeah. of the circle. Yeah. Uh, so just like Bill was saying, the idea of a circle eliminates the idea of a committee. So think more community than committee, right? With the disciplines that we've had through our dojo, so past and current disciplines that we've had, we've been able to create cultures and definitely communities of practice. These are people that journey with you and you get that when you join a call. You know, there is definitely, uh, when you join the circle, you get the feeling that you're all equals. We have a facilitator. This facilitator would essentially keep us on track. Don't think of them as a bus driver, but think of them as someone who maybe when we get distracted or when we fall down rabbit holes would remind us of what we should be talking about or what topic we currently have at hand. But we're all equals on the call. And this definitely fosters, you know, the trust that Bill was talking about and also safety that Bill had mentioned earlier. You know, it's very important uh, foundational block to what we're trying to build. Um, we hope we're hoping that when people come to the meetings for the very first time, when they leave, they feel like they are part of something, something that they could grow with, something that they know they can always contribute to. You know, That's what we're trying to foster with each circle. That's what we're trying to create with each dojo. I'm, I'm gonna chime in here a little bit. The, you know, the, it, by a lot, with that safety and, and with people coming together, the language, it, 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 you start to have more systems thinking language in here and you start to see different metaphors and mindsets and different motivations kind of coming into the conversation. So it it, it sort of elevates the level of conversation. It's, it's not as much about litigation and tribalism and right versus wrong, but it's it's really trying to figure out what are, what are different things we want to consider for a more integrated perspective. So different people contribute into the conversation and we, we bat things around, but it's, it's really striving for a more integrated perspective, um, a more unpacked uh, perspective versus kind of rushing through things. So it's, it's kind of a methodical conversation uh, that, that, that seeks to help influence towards, towards people being able to, to come together uh, in different ways. So this is a, a quick visual of the evolution of uh, the circle and the community within the circle. So like I mentioned, the, there's a gathering of peers who are interested in the topic of the domain at hand, again, whether it's mindset, uh, inner source, et cetera. And 
they'll continue to meet, continue to talk about the top topics at hand. And then like a new mentioned, there's a facilitator as well. Faci facilitator is a peer. Uh, it's not a, a hierarchical role. role. It's a, a person who has expertise and experience with the circle and the dojo. And they just help keep the discussion on track and make sure that we uh, focus on the items at hand for that particular circle. What's great is that you see leveling up uh, as people continue to uh, meet in the circle. So all individuals level up in their knowledge and uh, practice uh, on that knowledge. And so the circle as a whole gains and grows as it goes up. And then you uh, essentially have more facilitators who uh, step in because they have the experience at that point. And then they can leave the circle, you can hand off. And even uh, there's a possibility that facilitators move off and start a, a circle in a new domain. And, uh, and then it will start evolving naturally for that new domain. Michael. Right. And so we've, we've talked about some of the higher order constructs. Let's get a little more about the people, you know, the types of roles here that exist inside of inside of this uh, metaphorical construct, we'll say this community and th this community model. So the sensei and senpai, so sensei is, is like teacher, you know, they're really kind of responsible for the overall content. They, they are responding to content pull requests, for example. Uh, you know, we, we do invite people to make pull requests. We don't always go forward on them if they don't really make sense at a deeper purpose. Uh, so they're, they're, they're kind of helping guide, you know, not just, not just people in the community, even beginners, but also the, the content. And so they, you know, and that the respect is given based on the repetitions and, and the experience they have from experience, the dojo model from all perspectives. You don't really make it there without putting in a lot of work from a lot of different perspectives. The senpai is a, a senior student, right? And so this is this is really an important, this might be more important than the sensei role. Uh, and this, this is uh, something we've evolved into understanding as we go. And it's really, it, it's really creating a mentor-mentee relationship, but but the but the senpai also learns from the mentee in this case, right? So it's it's definitely still peers, uh, peers helping peers, uh, both of these. Uh, though there's there's some responsibilities that, that kind of that kind of happen and there's some respect that that gives that is given and both of these these uh these you know the people or these roles become centering influences into the into the curriculum into the into people's experience going through their journeys and so we we describe this as one you know very it's the same you know there's two two constructs here two roles but it's the same purpose ones who come before and relearn through practice with others. So the the the, the teachers are students in every uh, repetition, and we describe this overall pattern um, at at some point if if uh, people decide to go look at one of our model dojos as dialogue, action, reflection. So this this really this pattern of of how we explore a new domain. It's it's really exploring through dialogue. And then there's action, and at every step there's reflection. And we just, it, you know, wash and repeat, you know, rinse and repeat. And so the these sensei and senpai are doing a lot of modeling. They're doing productive challenge and in a rolling ways, and they're supporting people. It's analogous to, uh, you know, things we see in extreme programming and agile, uh, pairing, swarming, retrospectives, you know, throughout various frameworks and agile. And then to speak to uh, how this translates into the governance of the the, the project because there is code there's a code base too uh, the the product owners you know those are what we call core sensei uh, and this is realized through these are realized through github teams for example and the domain code owners these are what we call domain sensei right so you know specific domains have you know specific sensei and then um, the senpai are also they gain right access they they've they're, you know, they're guided a little bit, but they, they're trusted committers at that point. So, you know, they're still, still, you know, under the observation of, of the sensei, of course, but, you know, it's, it's an elevating uh, trust network as we, as we keep going forward. And then as we, as we go through this, there's, there's a fair amount of uh, social recognition in various ways. So, you know, when people, 
uh, make it to a certain level, they make a claim and then it's, you know, sort of tested, we demonstrate, you know, the knowledge, the claims get done through pull requests. So you'll see a, a pull request there, the belt claim, I'm making a claim if I'm doing that is through a pull request. There's stimulating questions that go through that process. Again, that's the reflection piece. And, and, um, but we recognize that, for example, on, on Slack, that's from our SAP Slack. That's, you know, Jeremy and Michael Graff. And, you know, then there's, you know, bet some badging, you know, if people want to, you know, that's a, a version, a, a version of my email signature there on the left. We do um, track internally uh, people's board area and department loosely. Here's an example of, uh, from a sample, this this is like a, a rendering at the bottom of, of one of our sample dojos. So <laughs> that's why the departments are kind of fun. Um, and then we we do, we're keeping track going forward with some stats and then, you know, analogous to uh, an Aikido or martial arts uh, dojo, there is a member board. Um, and and um, remember, you know, the the belt isn't an attainment. It's really it's really there to to help people understand where they're at and, 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 and other people to understand you know, how much, uh, how much work and, and, and sort of expertise they, they might be able to uh, connect with. Right. And then, so here we're talking about the force multiplier and organizational adaptability. Why should I care as an organization? This is all nice, but I care about money and stuff, right? That's really part of the, the truth of a for-profit corporation, for example. So we make a statement that DevSecOps, agile, and technical skill are not enough, at least not today. And so what we're what we're doing with, with uh, and we'll, we'll speak a little bit more in a couple of slides, is we're integrating mindset with domain-specific techniques. And this improves the flow, right? So now we're able to have people, you know, be able to process conflict a little more and sit in paradoxical conversations and come to a more uh, global, you know, uh, relatively higher order maximum you know, if you think of local maximum, global maximum sort of game theory, you know, so it's, it's to elevate, you know, people's experience through, through their, their, their work corporations in, in the, in this uh, standpoint. And, you know, we're also by, by being able to kind of process that conflict mindfully, sit with that and not feel like you're in danger as much. And just, you know, having a conversation a little, a little bit differently in a, in a more regular way, we can start naturally shifting to inclusive collaboration, right? Versus uh, oppositional. So it's it's not as much a litigation anymore as a collaboration. And then uh, what what starts to happen is we're able to align motivations with business outcomes. So now we get passionate individuals aligned into uh, more more readily into into business outcomes, uh, individuals and groups. So we're able to kind of all win by going a process like this. So I know Michael talked a little bit about the mindset domain, also known as the insight domain on the previous slide. One of the things, one of the things I love about this particular domain is the things we get when we gather on the mat, very, you could transfer quite easily to your work teams and other teams, even your home team, so your family, right? So with the mindset circle, the insight domain, think of the domain as Think of each domain actually as a live organism with missions, right? So the mission for this particular domain is to embrace change with compassionate curiosity. I'd like to add with grace also, you know, the things you learn in the mindset circle, the conversations we have, the way we unpack conflict could very easily translate to even the most tense business meetings, right? And you find yourself listening more, listening to learn, as opposed to just waiting for the other person to stop talking so you could jump in, you know, and say whatever it is, make the point that you're trying to make, which is how you end up losing people, right? We fully embrace the growth mindset and the curriculum reflects that. I know I mentioned earlier that um, think of each domain as a live organism. And Michael had also mentioned earlier that we continue to you know, people, everyone who is a member of the dojo can put in change requests. So when you put in a change request, say for something that is in the curriculum, we bring it to the mat, we discuss it. We discuss why something should be removed, why something should be added, the best place to put something, what we're hoping to get from it. We pretty much, it's not, I won't call it group think, but we bring everything, you bring everything to the mat and we unpack things together and we learn as we do that. We're constantly 
the learning on learning and relearning. It is a very beautiful experience, I have to say. Yeah. So before before transitioning, <laughs> I knew that was gonna happen. I just wanted to that's great, I knew. And I just wanted to touch on just a couple key points on the, the things on the right. So there's the curriculum, like Anu was talking about. A lot of it's influenced out of the spirit. You could look at the Smarter Every Day uh, podcast. Uh, Backwards Brain Bicycle is one that was very personally influential to me. It, it does appear in our dojo. But also the the next two things, the Institute for Zen Leader Leadership and, and the Black Swan Group, they each have some, you know, Zen Leader has like flips. And Black Swan Group has negotiation moves. And you'll start to see some of our in-group language is, you know, reflects that, you know, coping to transformation or to and that's some, some Zen leader language. Black Swan will have like dynamic silence, mirroring, paraphrasing to help people be able to kind of unpack that Anu was talking about. And so there's, there's uh, these, these are pretty stable, but it, it, it does evolve over time. But when we're noticing as we go through, when the group starts to adopt some of this language, it's a little, it's a little trickier to start to, to remove some of the key elements as they, they've been uh, quite powerful for, for some transformation for individuals and groups. And then the bottom shows, you know, the spread of the SAP uh, mindset domain. You'll, you'll see this kind of, this spread of, you know, there's, there's people sort of, uh, it gets, as it gets harder, not as many people uh, sort of make it, make it up through the track. So it's, it's like a dojo is like open to everyone, but not for everyone all the time. So it's very natural. It's not, it's not meant that everyone should, you know, should make it to, to a certain level. It's like how far they want to go and what, what makes sense for them. And, you know, sometimes people go through a journey quite, quite quickly and develop this language into existing patterns. Other times, it, frankly, it takes years and uh, that's, that's all okay. Thanks, Michael. Uh, and thanks, Anu. Um, so really quickly touching upon um, something that I mentioned earlier uh, when we started going from a, a traditional operations team to a DevOps team, kind of huddled up in our own little circle and said, again, where do we need to focus? And as we understood, you know, the, the, the focus needed to be around those three endpoints, people, uh, process, and product, we found these domains kind of complemented those three endpoints to a certain degree some of them more than others, right? But ultimately there was a sense of orbiting going around with the domains and those, those endpoints. Um, what you heard earlier about mindset is certainly uh, aligned to the people. What we're talking about or what I'm talking about now is more about the process. And then after this slide, we'll see more about product and technology. But as Anu mentioned, you know, each domain, we have missions, right? And in some cases, when we have multiple uh, areas of focus in a domain, we may see how they complement each other. Agile and Intersource certainly do in many different ways. Um, you may notice the missions are similar. The mission for Agile being influence the formation of empowered, self-organized teams. And you see the mission of Intersource being improve employee satisfaction and productivity through open source collaboration and culture, right? There's this orbiting going around of those two approaches. Um, for those familiar with the Agile Manifesto, we lean on those for our principles in Agile, and there's certainly complementary or overlap in intersource with the principles of openness, transparency, prioritized membership, and, and voluntary code contribution, right? Um, so ultimately, where we see uh, some harmony uh, is between the two is a bit of, you know, faster innovation and collaboration. In other words, we have shared ideas, more eyes on code. Again, maturing into a generative culture, we have transparency and shared ownership, regular and open you know, communication, early feedback. We're starting to see cross-functional teams uh, blossom and really flourish. Uh, and then ultimately we have this, this circle of continuous improvement um, underpinned in each of these approaches, uh, which is an iterative and incremental uh, approach. Uh, and then ultimately leaning on one of our colleagues uh, who really, um, wrapped it up really nicely for Intersource. He had mentioned Intersource empowers collaborative change. Um, and ultimately that gave me a lot to ruminate on personally um, and just, just those simple words, right? Um, so yeah, that's just a look again at the endpoint of process with the underpinned uh, domains here, Agile and Intersource. I'll make a little space to see if anybody would like to add on to that as far as the presenters before we move on. Yeah, I think you covered it, Jimmy. Okay, we will yeah. be.
yeah. and then pick, picking up the technology domains, this is where, you know, the initial motivation is. We don't know anything about Kubernetes and we are going to be a Kubernetes driven organization. What do you do with that? Right. So uh, the, the stats up on the right are that's the Kubernetes domain. This was, uh, you know, but to do this, we had to, to kind of build out the other domains, how we work with agile and, and uh, you know, we're going to do a lot of change, you know, mindset. Uh, became necessary uh, as as the changes keep coming, and so we just these kind of evolve faster. Uh, some of these aren't as durable. We've had a bunch of different uh, technology domains attempted. They seem to do well when there's a circle, when there's two or three committed sensei. When they when the those sensei their departments have adopted the dojo. Um, if the dojo is looked at similarly the plural site or something like that they don't last, Frank, quite frankly, and that's okay. It's okay to experiment. And so, you know, the, but the observability domain, it's strong, it's emerging. We'll see, you know, see how that goes. The security is, is we've tried a couple in, in, in uh, you know, attempts at this. This is a new proposed one we're looking at. So, but these, these are very important to the organization. Uh, they're just not as fundamental as the pro-social and change oriented domains. So uh, this is a callback to that uh, the slide. If you remember, we we burned down the house because we were afraid there was a spider in it. So it turns out not only do you not want to burn the house down, of course, but the spider was not even a spider. The spider was a cute kitty cat. And so uh, and this speaks to um, what Michael and Anu raised as well as the concept of uh, bringing these uh, ideas into actual uh your daily uh work and then starting to see change because of that and so that's what happened with the data engineering organization so specifically we were the team i was working with we were a bit stuck on uh going back and forth and delivering uh maximizing our deliveries uh via the process that we had we were struggling with that and so when i engaged with the dojo um, I started to learn the process, started to engage with the circle, and then very practically, uh, I saw the benefit and we took the circle idea and dropped it directly into our calls and meetings that we had within the organization. So we had different deliveries we needed from those calls. We had uh, meetings like uh, assumption mapping, architectural uh, decision records, and road mapping. And so you can imagine all your calls that you have that have different deliveries. But if you follow the circle method and you bring together subject matter experts as peers and they feel safe in giving you the information and their expertise, you get an immense value out of that. And I think that's uh, something that was missing previously that we used. So in this case, we took directly from the dojo, applied it to our organization, and then got immediate benefit when we started doing that. And then uh, Ryan, if you wanted to add to that. Yeah, as the Agile coach that was helping support uh, this uh, engineering, uh, data engineering area, uh, it's fun to see the team change over time, right? It, you see they have squabbles early, they don't interact the same. And as they go through a shared experience, similar to like the dojo or any shared experience, right? Um, you can see them transform and how they work and interact together and how they solve problems and how things get solved faster, right? Um, and it's also starting to align the rest of their peers um, as they've all gone through the same experience, but though they may not have gone directly together at the same time, now they will continue their transformation um, and, and join themselves as one team. So as they work towards that, they will start interacting more and it should feel like they're team members forever, even though they've never met a day in their life before in some cases. So uh, it's it's been a fun experience. I look forward to the next few steps they take with it. Yeah, and I just wanted to touch, touch on something. So like one of the things that unlocked for us to be able to inspect this last cohort, I guess, that went through the dojo, 40 to 50 people uh, with the data engineering group was we were able to analyze the belt claims in a um, ethical uh, way, right? An anonymous way to look for sentiments 
uh, sentiment themes, uh, things that people had difficulty, points of resonation in ways we hadn't been able to do this before. And we were able to, you know, create a, a high quality case study, you know, that we just haven't been able to kind of put the rigor around, quite frankly. So it, it, we used AI in various ways. The, uh, the, the article goes into it a little bit. We may have a follow on presentation later this year that digs into the AI uh, aspects of this, but we it, it puts us in position to make this a lot more measurable and repeatable, um, and the and easier to um, help people understand the the story that that uh, Bill and, and Ryan were talking about, and, and kind of become their a self advocate for uh, their journey. So that was exciting. And then um, here's you know if, if people want to dig into you know the the Dojo Center, which is an open model that that was forked off of the SAP sample uh, Dojo that the Open Source Program Office approved um, into the open source. So we have a nice sample Dojo from SAP, the Dojo Center. We'll see that on the next slide. And then there's stories that we've been um, working you know working with as we go from various lenses. They're all. We think they're quite uh, quite insightful. They're definitely were useful exercises for us who, who participated in writing them and um, and sharing the, with the groups that that inspired them. And then uh, the the three relevant uh, open source uh, links for the the sample dojo itself, the analyzer program that I was talking about on the previous slide, for example, and then the uh, the, the the open model that's been forked. And then if you are interested in this and you want to learn the, the best learning, the deepest learning is direct experience. There is an open dojo center. There's a dojo circle on Fridays at 1300 UTC. There's the link circle.dojo.center. Um, you can also go look at the, this, the curriculum center itself. There's a member board and there's also orientation. So the deepest, the, the, you know, anyone's free to drop in, um, be be respectful, I guess, in the spirit of what we're what we're doing. Here's some of the people that are are at this very very early stage. We're only a couple meet up meetings in, um, and and several of them have put their white belt on, myself included, to explore this path. The, the deepest experience, you know, it's not required, but the deepest experience is to probably do that. You can kind of experience the dojo. Uh, and go along this initial learning journey. So we're, we're trending topic wise into our, our mindset launch. And then we've been batting around, you know, inner source agile and mindset centering principles that that's going to continue. And then we're probably a little bit further out. We're, we're interested in this transition from, you know, first contribution to trusted committer, probably in a more generalized way of trusted uh, content creator or trusted, you know, conversational collaborator. Thank you very much.